Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that when a story is told, both the storyteller and the listener's brains are active in the same areas. It's called neural coupling, and what it means is that your two brains are in sync with each other so that when you're telling a story, you're actually putting thoughts, ideas, and emotions into your listener's brains. And this is why storytelling is an important part of getting whatever it is you'd like done. When you can tell a story, you can get the idea across in a way that you might not with just words. Today's episode is going to be obviously about telling stories, if I didn't sort of give you a hint with that cool fact of the day. But before we get into it, there's a couple of things that I want to share with you. Number one, I'm wearing my cool new Erlen filters. If you've heard the episode with Helen Erlen talking about how different light affects your brain, these are some new shades and update to my orange ones um, because my brain has actually changed. It's getting healthier. And this is a color that actually looks a little bit cooler than orange anyway, but I'll wear these sometimes, sometimes not. I'm right now just experimenting with them. And Moldy has now been seen by 60,000 people. So if you haven't seen Moldy Movie, go over to moldymovie.com Check it out, and while you're at it, check out bulletproofconference.com because it is now discounted for you to get there for the October conference. It's gonna be amazing. Today's guest is someone who was introduced to us through the Bulletproof forums, and that's a great place for you to go and suggest guests for the show. And it's uh, Robert McKee. Uh, Robert's a Fulbright scholar and one of the most sought after screenwriting lecturers around the globe. He runs the McKee Story Seminars, and for 25 years, he's been the guy you go to when you want to learn about writing and storytelling. He's taught more than 100,000 screenwriters, novelists, and playwrights, including a few guys you might have heard of like Peter Jackson, Russell Brand, Jimmy Fallon, Julia Roberts, Kirk Douglas, David Bowie, and a whole bunch more. So basically, famous guy has been performing at the very top of his game for many, many years. Welcome to the show, Robert. Oh, thank you, Dave. Uh, it's an honor to have you here. My, my pleasure. You wrote, or, or you created a seminar called Storynomics, yes. which is probably the most renowned. And you talk about how people use story in that. Can you give our listeners an understanding of why you focus so heavily on story in, in that seminar particularly? Well, it's a, it's a seminar, of course, as the title suggests, the um, uh, for business and for, um, you know, storynomics means, you know, the connection between story and money. Uh, and uh, what happened essentially is that over the years, uh, uh, a number of people who had no ambitions to write fiction um, or make documentaries or anything like that, simply business people, were coming to my lectures to try to learn uh the elements of story and how to compose a story uh, as uh, techniques for both uh, marketing, talking outward into the world and inward in leadership, uh, in strategizing, team building and so forth. And uh, so I was um, caught up in this and I talked to these people and I realized that there's a real need in the business community for some clear thinking on the nature of story and the use of story uh, in both directions, inward and outward uh, from and into the company. And so I put together Storynomics as a way to introduce people in business to the nature of story and the effective use of story in, in all of those directions. What has the biggest impact been when you've seen an organization or just say an entrepreneur, a, a CEO or a chief marketing officer, someone like that, who isn't good at storytelling, who comes to one of your seminars and learns the power of story, like what shifts would they see in, in how they communicate? Well, what shifts, of course, is the, is their, when they use it and use it well. Of course, it is, it's, a, it's not just a matter of using any old story, but the story that they tell has to be well told and effective. But when they uh, master it and learn to tell a story well, the success of the company escalates. I mean, what the net result is that they, they have a greater income, their business expands. I mean, one of my clients uh, is a construction company, uh, a major construction company called Bolt 
construction. They build power plants and uh, hospitals and educational uh, institutions of all kinds. Um, they used to bid in order to you know get their uh, work. They have to win a bid competitively, and they used to bid in the old-fashioned way of pitting their numbers against the competitors' numbers in a, just a you know a rhetorical point 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 yeah. point. Therefore, higher bid, higher bolt to uh, bill. Um, I taught them how to storyfy their bids, how to tell the story from the client's point of view, making the the client the core character in the story, uh, and use the same data. I mean, the, not the numbers don't change, but the vehicle for uh, conveying those numbers and the process of the bid and the dynamics of the bid to the client uh, changed greatly, and as a result. They went from winning one bid out of ten to winning one bid out of two. Wow. They doubled their gross. They jumped 20 places up the 100 top construction companies in America by simply learning how to take data and storyfy it. And as you were saying in your introduction, when you do that, the, the, the people making the bid, the people listening to the bid are in sync. And, um, and so... Um, uh, that's the result, is uh, that communication becomes enormously more effective. So if you're just getting started in your career, let's say, um, you know, early 20s, just finished school, and you're going in for a job interview. Yeah. If you can tell a story, it sounds like you have a much better chance of getting the job, right? You do, but uh, that's, uh, that's a tricky uh, terrain. You have to know what kind of story to tell. Um, I, in those situations, I would not advise somebody to go into a, an interview and start telling the, the interviewer the story of their life. Uh, yeah, that's bad. <laughs> that, that's bad news. That, 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 you know, there's a, that, and they have to learn this in marketing as well. Um, the thing that turns people off more than anything else is bragging. Yes. Uh, bragging and promising. I'm the best. I, I'm this, I'm that bragging and I will do this for your company and I will do that. Bragging and promising um, really turns people off. The best story to tell, I would think, in the context of an interview, is about someone else, maybe a, uh, a teacher who really inspired you. Um, I think you should avoid your parents. Um, but um, somebody else other than yourself uh, something about the nature, a story that would um, link you to the nature of the company and the kind of work you're being interviewed for, but is not on the nose about you. Uh, and, and so you, you get the same thing across, which is your enthusiasm, uh, your knowledge of the, of the job, uh, your preparation for the job, your passion about uh, doing this kind of work, all of that can get across, but in a story, that stars the person that's interviewing you, that stars the company that you're going to go work for. I mean, if you told a really effective story demonstrating that you've done your research and you know this company inside and out, you know what they do, and you want to be a part of that enterprise, tell the story about the company that you're trying to uh, be hired by, uh, any of those ploys would be much more effective than simply saying, you know, telling your life story. Uh, but once you get that, uh, <clears throat> putting it in story form rather than a list of facts, uh, when that company was established, how much money that company makes, how many clients they have, etc. Just reciting a list of facts about the company is not a story. And so you'd have to take what you know, your knowledge, convert it to a story starring someone other than yourself that implies um, who you are and why they should hire you. Uh, if you can manage a strategy like that, um, interviews would go very, very well. One of the favorite questions uh, that I like to ask people during an interview is, uh, tell me about a time you failed. <laughs> because I'm actually totally okay with people who fail at things. Usually if you haven't failed, then you're going to be really afraid of it and you won't push your limits because you're, you're so concerned about it. How would you go about 
that kind of situation where, where someone asks you to tell kind of a negative story, but one that might have a gold lining. Is, is there a way to do that in a way that's advantageous? Well, off the top of your head, that story, if they didn't see that question coming, that's very dangerous. <laughs> uh, very dangerous. Um, yeah, the, the, the story that you would tell there would have to start yourself, wouldn't it? Um, uh, and um, uh, the, the risk is um, uh, that the people, of course, uh, would get dishonest about that. Yeah. They'd make one up. Um, and however they, they failed in whatever story they told, it wouldn't be their fault. So, um, uh, yeah, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I, the only advice I could give to um, somebody on the receiving end of that question is um, is to tell the truth, and the um, the climax of the story would have to be a positive one, even though it's about failure, and that the climax would be what I learned by failure. Yes. And um, uh, but um, let's take an exceptional person to improvise that story if they didn't know the question was coming. Uh, that, I think it's because I like to hire exceptional people. Uh, yeah. Shout out to all the Bulletproof team. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's a tough one because if you are afraid of, of failure, oftentimes that fear can interrupt your ability to tell a good story. Uh, and it, it may trip you up and, and make you a little bit more honest. But I guess I gave away my secret because now everyone who hears this will know I might ask that during an interview. But uh, that, that's okay, too. <clears throat> well, people in business generally, of course, are risk averse. Yeah. And um, one of the difficulties they have in using story to communicate is that um, story has to have a negative component. Uh, if it's going to have a positive ending, it has to at some point hit a negative base. Yeah. It has to be a problem and its solution. But you have to be able to dramatize that problem, dramatize the need or whatever, uh, what's gone wrong or needs uh, a solution. And so um, uh, that is often difficult for people in business because they just don't want to be associated with anything negative. And uh, one of the uh, problems I have working, and but I can get past this, but when working with a client, I've got to get them over there, what I call negophobia, <laughs> which is rampant everywhere in business, the fear of all things negative, of saying, in fact, I... I was told about a book, I haven't read it, but a book of, on business in which the writer advised people that when they're in meetings, they should never use the word but. Hmm. But is too negative. You know, we tried to do this, but it didn't work. We went in this direction, but we should have gone in another direction, whatever. The word but, he claimed, is too negative, and so therefore, he recommended using the word however. <laughs> oh, come on. It's the same word, but more highfalutin. Of course it is. Of course it is. <laughs> but however, he felt, was just uh, was easier on the ears and less somehow negative. I mean, that is how hypersensitive people in business are to anything negative, anything that suggests failure, anything that suggests even risk. Um and if they can't get over that, I mean, if they can't bring themselves to grapple with reality, and you know, half of reality is negative, uh, uh, they, their stories have no energy. Their stories just become some kind of bragging and promising, uh, or some kind of emotional manipulation uh, using uh, pretty pictures to seduce, or if it's a political campaign, using negative pictures to damn the opponent, but some kind of... Um, uh, emotional manipulation, uh, and so um, and so, uh, getting people in business to really embrace the power of story. One of the, you know one of the great tasks I have is to get them to deal in reality and recognize that every well-told story is going to have some. It's going to have a negative dimension to it in order that the positive ending of the story have impact. Because if it's positive, 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 it's meaningless. It, it yeah. lacks credibility, right? And, and you yeah. can't have light without darkness. And that also. Exactly. We know that. And, you know, and people in business know that you know, it isn't all sunshine and strawberries. And so, um, uh, and so they, they don't believe it. When they hear somebody reciting positive, 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 they sit there 
skeptical, cynical, not buying it. Um, but as I said, to get uh, business people over that threshold, I have to um, you know show them many great examples, of course, of storytelling that has that negative dimension, and that is why it has such power. What is the single best example of storytelling that you know of? Oh, I, they, uh, every day somebody somewhere comes up with a whole new <laughs> wonderful marketing campaign or uh, speech and leadership uh, uh, tactic that uh, knocks me out. Uh, right now, I happen to be in love with the Adobe company. Okay. Uh, Adobe is putting out and I don't know the ad agency that they hired to do this, but it could have been done in-house. I, I just don't know. But Adobe, um, their market uh, is marketers. Yeah. Adobe has you know, uh, marketing software, marketing servicing, and so, they, and so they've got to sell this to marketers. I mean, if, if I could create a special place in hell, uh, that would be it, that your job is to market to marketers, right? Yeah. And they've got a series that they put out that star marketers uh, that is so effective. The storytelling is just brilliant. And what they've done is they've, they've really sat down and asked themselves what it is to be a marketer. Day in, day out, the, you know, the CMO has got people coming in pitching this software, this system, this, 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 or that, and, um, and they, they, you know, and making promises. You know, this is going to, uh, I've seen it. I've seen an ad campaign that, uh, uh, marketing campaign done for Coca-Cola that promised it would double Coke sales. I mean, I mean, <laughs> of all the absurdities, but nonetheless, wow. um, yeah. Promises like that. And, and and so when marketers are sitting there fielding these pitches from these companies like Adobe, uh, the first problem they have, of course, is bullshit. Most of what they're hearing is bullshit. Yeah. The second problem is that when they use this uh, technology, uh, the data is erroneous. They get a lot of false data. They're promising data that will really let them make decisions based in reality, but the data itself is flawed. And so, and so uh, Adobe's got these wonderful pieces out where they show marketers dealing with fielding the bullshit from uh, uh, software salesmen, uh, dealing with false and inaccurate data. And these stories uh, just knock me out. They're done with wit. Uh, they're done with a certain wonderful kind of cynicism, and yet I ju you just know that they, they're terrifically effective. I mean, Adobe Adobe is doing very very well uh, against its competition, and so Adobe understands marketers and tells stories that star marketers, and as a result, the, the people that they're pitching to are moved uh, to adopt uh, Adobe's technology. Let's say that you're not running Adobe's marketing, but you're, uh, let's say, in the Parent Teacher Association, PTA. Yeah. How can you take these storytelling skills and sort of just use them in, in daily life to be more effective uh, rather than, than sort of at the boardroom level? I, I, I think a lot of people listening don't know how to, how to bring those skills to, to use on a daily basis. Well, how do you, you advise people to do that? Well, you, you, to, to tell an effective business story. Mm -hmm. Right now, this is not fiction. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I'm true stories, right? Fiction. These are business stories. This is what I. They are what I call the purpose told story. The purpose told story is not entertainment. I mean, if it's well told, it will be entertaining, like those Adobe pieces I mentioned. But um, it's not entertainment. It's told to to hook attention, hold attention, and then pay off that attention with a story climax that moves the listener to action. The purpose is to get people to do what you need them to do, to take action, to buy a product, uh, to agree with a policy and execute the policy, whatever it is. So if I uh, was uh, on, on a school board and um, 
I need uh, votes on that board and, uh, to, to, take a, to, to take an action I want that I think will be effective for the school. Uh, the first step is to identify the audience. I mean, stories are actually written backwards, not forwards. You start with the ending. And, and the purpose told story in, in business especially. What, who am I talking to? And identify that audience very specifically. And then um, the next question is, and where does it hurt for that person? What does that person need? What does that person uh, want? What is their problem? Where does it hurt? What are they suffering from? Uh, and identify their need, their, their where it hurts. Then you have to ask yourself, and what do I want this person to do? <clears throat> to, to vote my way or whatever, okay? Uh, and so when you understand who you're talking to and what their problem is in life that your story is going to solve, and, how, and, the, and after they've heard your story, how you want them to then act, getting all of that together right, is the first step. Then you go back and you... Um, and you did, in that case, of course, you would make the person you're talking to the core character of the story. You would tell a story about them, a story that says, I'm on your side. I know where you hurt. I've been there. I've seen it. I get it. And, um, and here's how you, by voting this way, can take a step towards solving your problem and, um, making what hurts go away. And so that's, you know, that, that's a simple process, but it, it, I mean, it's not, it's simple to talk about, it's not easy to do, but just, it starts with the ending. Who am I talking to? Where does it hurt? What do I want them to do? Then you go back and you compose a story designed uh, to dramatize your understanding of their problem and starring them, not you, them. I mean, this is um, one of the most important steps for any business to take is to understand that today they must become consumer centric. The stories that they tell have to be about the consumer and they have to star the consumer and dramatize an awareness of the consumer's needs in life um, and, um, and that, uh, that your company or your whoever are on, on, on the consumer side. So if I were on the board of, um, of a school and, uh, and I'm talking to parents, that's a different audience. It's a different kind of hurt um, and a different kind of need. And so I would tell the story about the parents and their struggle to um, get a, a first-rate education for their children, and all that, like that. Um, and so that, you know, you start with the ending. Start with the ending. All right, and I, I've found that the ability to communicate really complex ideas in a story uh, helped enormously. For a while, I ran the Web and Internet Engineering Program for the University of California. And, mm -hmm. and there, I'm, I'm trying to tell a story about you know this packet that needs to go from one end of the Internet to the other, and, and it traverses all these different terrains. But the, it was such a complex thing, the only way I could figure out to convey this over five years of testing it was to sort of tell a story about, all right, like you, you personalize this little bit of information in all the places it goes. Uh, I wish that I had known that early in my teaching career because it was the facts didn't work, even with engineers. Uh, but the the picture, the, the story that went along with it, and that helped to form even the way that we're talking today, just kind of beating myself against the wall of really complex ideas. Um, that was a painful lesson for me. When you're talking with some of your clients, like Microsoft <laughs> and uh, these really big companies, yeah. uh, how do you how do you short circuit that long learning process to make someone good at telling a story or at least passable so that they can get these ideas across? Um, well, I, I workshop. Okay, and and the workshops that you do, how long are they? Uh, depends. Um, um, at least a day or two. Okay. Depends. Uh, it depends on how many people do they want me to work face-to-face uh, -face with. Um, and so um, uh, the workshop you know, consists of the, uh, the executive um, comes in uh, with what they think is a story. 
and um, I don't give them any, you know, I don't give them any lecture. I'm, perhaps they've come to my storynomics before, uh, but they they get up and they pitch. They tell their story. Then I take it apart and I show them what worked and what didn't and how they could uh, fix it. And then they go off for whatever time and they rewrite or rework that story and they come back and they do it a second time to see if they can you know, take this direction and rework the story in an effective way. Uh, and then we take notes again and, and you know, uh, we have an audience of other executives, people at the company who are you know, working um, uh, on these problems as well and they give notes. Uh, but it's primarily my notes, and um, and so they do it at least twice, and then if it's the second day, they come back uh, again, third time, and they see the progress. I mean, I can explain to people what a story is. I can show them multitude examples in various contexts of people using story, not just to market, but in leadership. Um, and that takes them to a certain point of understanding. But still, they need to practice. I mean, they need to do it, uh, to take notes, and to be shown, because I'm a good storyteller. And so I can take almost anybody's story that they pitch to, uh, uh, to, um, to, the, to the company and or to um, you know, hypothetical uh, clients, and, um, and I can rework that story on the spot. And... The, the moment I do, they immediately say, oh, yeah, that, that would be better. That would be better. Be, you know, because they're making all the amateur mistakes. <laughs> so uh, and so they, they learn from that. So workshops is a bridge that takes them from understanding from the lecture, uh, getting it through examples, and, uh, and then doing it themselves with critiques. Uh, that's how you teach. And it's, it's simple. It's, it's, uh, it's just like, you know, the way they used to teach in college, you went and had a lecture and uh, and a recitation, and in the recitation, the recitation leader, some grad student probably, showed you face to face how this thing works, or how to do that kind of math, or whatever the problem would be. And so it's the same process: you give them learning, you give them examples, and then you give them practice. In, in 2002, I, I was getting my MBA. And I try to convince my classmates that we should do a, a project on what is now called neuromarketing. I wanted to hook electrodes up to my classmates' heads, measure their brainwaves while we basically told them stories or while they looked at advertisements, mm -hmm. uh, which are a form of visual storytelling, and just to see what their brains would do so we could kind of figure this out. Yeah. And this has now become a much more of a science than it was a decade ago, and uh, maybe two, three years ago. I sat next to the CMO of Monsanto at a neuromarketing conference at Stanford. And, okay, that, that kind of scared me a little bit. <laughs> but is storytelling a form of manipulation? Like, like is, is it fair for a company to be able to tell a really effective story? Are, are, they, are they taking advantage of, of their customers or their audience when they do that? No. Uh, no, you you can lie you can lie either way. Okay, <laughs> very fair point. Have a choice. Okay, you can put PowerPoint presentation up there and slant all the data in your favor, which is what we do when we make a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, that's what PowerPoint's for, right? At the bottom, <laughs> at the end of the day, you want to persuade, and so you you put up your data, your authorities, your pie charts, and whatnot. You put up your point, 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 point. Therefore, right, and you you deliberately distort it. You ignore or avoid everything that would contradict what you're saying. That's one kind of persuasion. The, the, the wonderful thing about story is that in order to use story to persuade, to get the light to go on and people go, oh, yeah, I get it, you have to show the negative side. <clears throat> in rhetoric, you... Do not show the, the anything that contradicts yourself. But in, in story, you're talking about reality, the dynamic of change, how things move from positive to negative, and and you and you you know you you have to embrace both sides to tell a story, but it can be bullshit too. You story can distort and um, but the, the, the interesting thing is, though, most people know when they're being bullshitted. 
And so if you if you use story to bullshit, it won't work because people have a kind of uh, you know uh, uh, an antenna for the truth, and they know when it's distorted, when it's a lie. So you you know you as I said, you can lie in rhetoric, you can lie in story. It's more difficult to lie in story, but let's say you can't. Um, and in terms of fairness, no. I mean, there, there's no, there's nothing unfair about an honest communication saying, look, here's the situation. This is where this company has been. This is where the company is now. And here's our strategy and story form for the future. And if we, if we follow this strategy, we will have success. If we go in that direction or that direction, we will fail. That is honest. That is as real as it is possible to get. Uh, and uh, your, your projection for the future may not pan out, but you have a plan. And it's based in, in data. It's based in reality. Uh, and it's as, uh, you know, it's as truthful as anything ever gets in life. And so there's, it's not a question of ethics. Uh, I mean, to lie is to lie. Ethically, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's immoral to do that. But, you, you know, whichever way you do it, out of rhetoric or in story, it's a lie. And so, uh, and there's nothing wrong with rhetoric, rhetoric by the way. I mean, if you, if you can really make an excellent PowerPoint presentation uh, that has, you know, solid fact that people don't argue with, and convince people that this is the logic of it, and therefore, right? Uh, why not? I mean, I'm, I'm not a fanatic for story. I, what I'm a fanatic for is excellent communication yeah. in business, and what whatever communicates the truth is, um, you know, is um, uh, effective uh, business technique. Whatever communicates lies is just going to come back and bite you in the ass. And so that. Whatever the, you do it. And so, uh, and so, if you're, you know, if you're honest and you're you're trying to persuade people to see things for what they really are, then um, there's no ethics. Uh, there's no ethics, question of ethics. So the the built-in integrity detector that yeah. we all have, sure, it is is part of that. Okay, sure. Uh, that, that's it's, a, it's 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 self it's it's survival. If, if people in business lie to one another, deceive one another uh, within the company, the company's doomed. Yes. If they lie to their clients or to their customers, the market will destroy them. Yep. And today, more than ever, because today people communicate faster and, and wider th uh, than ever before, and uh, things go viral. Success goes viral, yeah. and uh, lies go viral. And they will rate you one to five. <laughs> so yeah, uh, and so I, I'm, you know, I, I've said that storytelling, the ability to take data, storyfy it, and tell a story that from the from the, you know, either the consumer's point of view, what you were talking about, Dave, you, uh, for those years that you were working, uh, uh, you had a product centric story. And your problem was to get empathy for that product. Right. Right? And so you had to personify that product in such a way that people didn't, um, uh, the people understood the story is not directly about them, but it, 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 by implication it's about them. And that they, they identified, you're trying to get them to identify with the product itself. Uh, when you're, the, the third possibility, of course, is what we call branding. And there, you're trying to get the, the world to um, take a positive attitude toward a brand and try to get empathy for a brand, getting empathy for a corporation. Again, I, I can't think of harder work than that. Um, <laughs> and uh, given the, you know, the, the attitude. I read the other day that if 95% of all brands disappeared tomorrow, 95% of all people would not care. <laughs> so, and so getting the, the, the public uh, to take an attitude uh, uh, toward, uh, toward brand, there's, a, there's a, a metric company called Hamas that does 
what they call the meaningful brand index, uh -huh. and uh, and the the measurement is based upon the public's attitude. This brand enhances my life. This wow. brand improves my life. Uh, and guess what is number one at the top of the meaningful brand index? Apple. Nope. Google? It's up there. It's number three. Okay. Not a bad guess, but I, I'm not sure it would be number one. Google. Oh, I did Google. That was my second choice. All right. Yeah. That's number one. This brand improves my life. Uh, you know what was number two between Google and uh, Apple? Samsung. Oh, wow. Okay. Because um, this, is, this is an international. Uh, oh. Right? And, Power in numbers. Uh, outside of the United States, Samsung has as much or more presence in the world as Apple does. Uh, must, must anyway, the attitude is this brand improves my life and therefore people identify with the brand uh, and the feeling that this brand is on my side. This brand understands me. Uh, <clears throat> this brand is working to improve my life. Uh, <clears throat> and to do that, you need story. There's no other way. You can't just say we're the biggest, we're the best, we're the, you know, whatever, and expect people to identify. And the, the, if companies don't get this, they're in real trouble. Because the, the, the millennial generation, people under the age of 35 or so today, uh, they see bragging and promising coming a mile away, and they laugh at it. Yeah. They see emotional manipulation coming and they laugh at it. They know when people are trying to use them. They know when people are bullshitting. Uh, and they find bragging and promising just ill-mannered. Yeah. Ill-mannered. And so uh, uh, if, a, if a company today uh, wants to get that millennial market and hold it over the decades in the future as these people uh, you know, grow older, uh, uh, they have to stop this typical, I mean, we have been, the, the essence of advertising for over a hundred years has been bragging and promising, bragging and promising. That just does not work anymore. But advertising agencies and PR firms continue to brag, continue to promise, and then wonder why the brand's awareness is declining, wonder why sales aren't you know, increasing. Uh, and uh, old people, you know, like me, you know, we, we we're so used to bragging and promising. Uh, we don't sneer uh, much, <laughs> uh, but um, young people do. And then, and they don't want to be interrupted. Uh, the, what they want is to be entertained. And a story is a you know, business story is a very brief. Usually we have one turning point, maybe two, and they're, they're very brief. And the most precious asset that a company can have is the ability to get attention and to hold attention for whatever time it takes, 30 seconds, three minutes, whatever, to hook and hold attention and move people to act. But, but the first you got to get their attention. And the way you get the attention is you tell a story that has a hooky opening, you a, a turning point that hooks interest. Go and so it goes, really, really, what what happens next? And um, uh, uh, bragging does not get attention. People right. Just turn it off. Now, if if you were to stand up and and. If you were to market to an older audience, you might stand stand up and, and say something very much like, look, look at all the success, you know, I, I, I've, I've done really, really well, et cetera, et cetera, whatever. Um, if you were to take that and translate it to a story that would work for a younger audience, but you want to convey that same, that same idea, um, how do you, how do you flip it? What do you do in order to basically, uh, how do you turn bragging into a story? It, assuming that, that the, 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 the bragging is, is there. So. I'm really, really well. I'm, I'm really, really good at what I do. I'm, 
you know? Well, that's in, in fact, let, let's, uh, well, I'll just put it, I'll put it out there. I lost 100 pounds, right? And I'm not bragging about it. I still have stretch marks. Like, like you know, I, I was obese for much of my life, right? The only reason I bring this up is that when I'm talking with people who are trying out the stuff that I do, the stuff that I wrote about in my, my New York Times bestselling book, it is, yeah. it's illustrative of the point. But honestly, it's not, hey, look at me. There's, there's 10,000 guys who are more ripped with better abs than me. But it's like, look, this is an example of what you can do. How do you, how do, you do that? Because I, I don't really brag about this. But there are people who are like, oh, Dave likes to talk about himself. No, I like to talk about how you can lose a ton of weight. And I just happen well, to be Why don't you just talk about how you can lose a ton of weight? Cool. Just, shift, just shift your pronouns. Okay, cool. All right? It's not hard. It's just getting rid of the words I, me, mine, my, you know. Amen. <laughs> and change it to you. Yes. Uh, and yeah. Right, you is both plural and singular, and so um, just shift the pronoun around, and um, and you know one in, in one way to get it back to your success is to uh, you know tell a story that that, that stars you whoever you're talking, and reach point where the person is, <laughs> and then you say there's a way out, um, and um, and this is the technique, or this is the change that you have to make in your lifestyle. Uh, and I suffered this. When I made that change, okay, <clears throat> you know, uh, and, so, um, and so being able to validate that you have gone through what they're going through or will go through um, is important, but as soon as possible, get it back to them. That, that makes sense. I, I just want to be the, the guinea pig there to say, look, it's possible uh, because the work that I do is, is certainly about making change in other people. I, I'm pretty happy with where I am now, and, and that's, you know, I, I don't need to talk about myself. Uh, so, no, but, you know, but, you know, it, it, it helps. I mean, when you mentioned your book just now, I'm sure out of habit, you said it was a New York Times bestseller. That's bragging. Cool. Um, th thanks for that. I, I'm always, I'm always torn now because with ebooks, the seller it just comes out, right? Yeah. Um, uh, th thanks for that feedback. Um, there's, ah, I'm just, yeah. okay. but it's great. Um, you see, it, I, it, it, it depends on how face to face you are with your, the person you're talking to. Right. When you're literally face to face, you can see it in their eyes when there's doubt. Okay. Therefore, you can move the story that you're telling to, um, to satisfy that doubt by saying, um, uh, this, you know, I wrote a book on this, right? And um, X thousands of people used it, and I get, you know, letters and emails telling me thanks, okay? So I, you know, it will work. Um, and, and let them assume that it was a bestseller given the numbers that you, whatever. Uh, it, but if you're telling a story as you do, you know, uh, broadcasting, uh, then you, you, you can't see their faces and you have to uh, sense when their doubt uh, might arise and find a way to move the story towards something that would um, to satisfy that doubt. Um, you, if you've done this long enough, you you know how to have that sort of sixth sense that tells you, you know, this is a point where I, I think I need to use a little rhetoric, introduce yep. the facts, and um, to bolster the, this moment. Um, and how much or how little of that, who can say? It really depends on so many factors that vary from, from story to story. But the, the, one, the, the, the beautiful thing about story is it allows you, if you come to a turning point, it allows you, you've got their curiosity, it allows you then to dump exposition in and to, and to pour in the facts because they're hooked. They want to know how is this going to turn out. And at that point, then comes the data. And so the story incorporates data uh, wonderfully. And so so you, you've got facts to back up 
but you want to put them in a context at a moment when um, they um, they're really hooked and they really want to know. Uh, and um, in what you were saying at the very beginning in your introduction that there's a neurology to this, there's a neuroscience behind this, and that when you tell a story really well, there comes a moment in the listener, in the audience, where their mind is absolutely open and receptive. At that point, you put in the brand. In that point, you put in the, the, the last step, the one you want them to take to, um, to uh, look into the, the service or the product. And uh, you can't get that in rhetoric. Rhetoric is arm twisting of a certain kind. But story just opens people up and makes them receptive when it's well done, of course. All of this is predicated on skill and a, and a really well told story. One of the things that Bulletproof Radio focuses on is understanding how people get to the top of their game. And Peter Jackson called you the, the guru of gurus. And you're one of the top storytellers out there. And, and where I've probably been deficient in asking questions today because I just actually got a chance to be schooled by a guru. But um, how did you get to be so good at this? Like, what what did you do to, to be at this level? I told the truth. That's the real difference. First of all, I have real knowledge. I... This, the, the, the lectures that I give are based on decades and decades of experience directing in the theater. I directed professionally over 60 plays. I acted professionally in 60 plays. And therefore, my job was to unravel what writers had done and then recreate it in a performance or in a cast of characters on stage. Um, I followed that with three years of research and a bibliography that was literally 300 titles long uh, into the art of story for stage, page, and screen. Uh, and then I was a writer. And um, I you know, had a good deal of success writing television. Uh, and um, I sold 20, had 20 screenplay deals in Hollywood, so I was a successful writer. So I had knowledge. Uh, and uh, I noticed that what other people were doing in, the, in trying to teach writing was pretending that it's easy and that there's a formula. And step by step, you follow this recipe and voila, a wonderful screenplay, and you'll have your name on the screen and make a million dollars. And essentially, they were lying to people. They were pretending it was easy and that anybody could do it. Uh, what I did and do is tell the truth. This is really difficult. You're probably in over your head. And if you're going to succeed, you're going to have to dedicate the next 10 years of your life and 10 years of failure and 10 screenplays that nobody wants, plays that never see a stage, books that nobody publishes. It's going to take you 10 major works of story art to fail again and again and again in order to master this very difficult art form. And I, I lecture to drive the dilettantes out of the room. I only lecture to dedicated professionals. And I don't mean people who make money writing. I mean professional in their attitude. They have high standards. They're not just trying to copy last year's summer hits or whatever. Uh, they want to write original, insightful meaningful, emotional storytelling for stage, page, or screen. And I take a tough attitude toward it, and I make people work really hard in the lecture. They take 100 pages, 200 pages of notes. Um, and um, the result is my reputation uh, grew. Uh, word of mouth spread around the world that this guy will sit you down and will not bullshit you and you will learn what story is and um, and you will have some insight into content as well as form. I think that's the reason I'm a success. I really do. Uh, I, I hear whispers, but I don't, I've never been to anybody else's lecture, but I hear you know, whispers about what goes on and the ass kissing <laughs> 
is notorious in these things. <laughs> and uh, I just won't do that. I, don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, rude. I try not to be rude, but I don't kiss their ass. I don't hold their hands. Writing is the loneliest job in the world. You got to sit in your pit in your, with your characters in your head, and there's nobody there to help you. And you got to do it on your own. And, you know, seeking support and what is just another form of procrastination. <laughs> You have to do it on your own. And so I don't want people coming to my lecture thinking that I'll be there for them. <laughs> I'm not going to be there for them. They're going to do it on their own. And when they, you know, and when people reject their first efforts, I mean, the first thing you write is always the worst thing you'll ever write. I mean, any common, you know, common sense tells you. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and when it's rejected, you know, you're going to have to pull yourself back up and and, uh, and start the next project. I mean, writers aren't people with a story to tell. Writers are people with stories to tell their whole life. And so they start the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and, it's, and they're going to do it on their own. So, uh, if they can't deal with the truth in my lecture, they're never going to deal with it on their own uh, at their keyboard. Uh, so anyway, I'm tough, and... Uh, <clears throat> and practical and real and um, and I you know and I don't bullshit and uh, but it's a lot of fun. The lecture is also very funny. I mean, I used to do stand up comedy and I I use a lot of <clears throat> a lot of shtick in what I do. Uh, it's to you know and uh, and so um, and so that as a result, word of mouth spread around the world for the last 25, 30 years. That um, that you'll learn from this guy, uh, and um, <clears throat> it is what it is. I never made any effort to market it. Um, I got it. At the phone would ring. People would call. I'd get invitations to come to this part of the world, that part of the world. Um, uh, it just it just happened purely by word of mouth. Well, uh, I can tell you during the course of this interview, you've convinced me that I need to come to uh, one of your lectures. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely be doing that um, probably in LA somewhere. Yeah, you'll get you'll get an invitation, Dave. Don't worry. Oh, beautiful. I, I appreciate it. And there's a question that every guest on Bulletproof Radio answers at the end of the show. And it's based on all the stuff you know, not just about storytelling, but just your entire life's path. If someone came to you and said, look, I want to perform better at everything. What are the three most important things that they need to know or three things they need to do? Like the, just the most important piece of advice you have for someone, the top three. Well, persistence. Um, it, it, it takes practice to, to perfect something. And, and so you can't give up. You have to, you have to persist. Um, and, some people are capable of persistence and uh, others not. And, and uh, people just generally wait for a crisis and then they get serious and how long they can stick to it, who can say. But persistence, uh, number one. Number two is um, a high standard. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to do something well, you've got to want to do it as well as the very best people who do this thing do it you won't necessarily get to that level. You know, that's a rarefied stratus for, for the, the most talented and the most whatever. But um, in the constant pursuit of perfection, uh, you will achieve the best. Uh, people who uh, achieve are, are not willing to settle for good enough. <clears throat> and so um, they have to have high standards. They have to be persistent. And they have to understand that excellence of any kind, whether it's a sport, whether it's a business thing, whatever, that excellence of any kind is based upon knowledge. They have to do research. They have to know what it is they're trying to do. And the more they can um, uh, understand what they're trying to do, the better they'll be at it. The notion that you can rely on your instincts is really foolishness. Robert, thanks for that incredible knowledge. 
I, I really appreciate being able to learn from, from someone at your level. Where can people find out more about Storynomics and about what you do, the, the, just your overall body of work? They go to um, our website, uh, which is mckeestory.com. That's M-C-K-E-E story.com. That's it, mckeestory.com, and it'll all be there for them. Okay, and we'll put that link in the show notes so people can come on over and download the transcript or anything else. Uh, in order to to find your work. I I really appreciate you taking the time on Bulletproof Radio today because uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be able to talk to people who spent their whole career focusing on one skill and helped some of the the very top people in the world. So I I, I consider it uh, really uh, an amazing opportunity to get a chance to chat with you, and I enjoyed myself. And I enjoyed it too. Those were good questions, and uh, um, it was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot.